on the public accommodations, Berghoff's men's grill in Chicago didn't allow women to come in to the to one part of the restaurant. So, and um, Carson Peary Scott had you couldn't women weren't allowed to come into the dining room during the lunch hour because the men had important things to do and they weren't just shopping all day. So they had to have that lunch hour. They had to have that restaurant available to them and we couldn't be there. So we targeted these places and we we went and sat in. I mean, we... we is this in 68 then? I mean, this was it's 68, 69. It's one of the first things okay. we did. Mm -hmm. And it was... Um, you know, we did model, we looked around at the civil rights movement, we obviously modeled ourselves on that. Okay, they sat in, we'll sit in. You know, so we went and sat in at Berghoff's. And, um, and we did that at Carson Pierce God. And of course, we took the press with us. Uh, there's a woman, Joanna Martin, who was, she, worked, she actually did press by day for the Urban League. She's a white woman, but she worked for the Urban League. She was very good at what she did. And she did the chapter at night. I mean, there was so much of this where people were had their day job and then their night job was this incredible activity around the women's movement. So Joanna was smart, and she knew how to get us press. So she, we would go to these places. Berghoff's, you know, there's still footage of us invading Berghoff's trying to get them to change the policy. And then the same thing with Carson Peary Scott. And then we had Judy Longquist, who probably is in your list somewhere. She was the legal staff person, or legal volunteer for us. So she did the research, and there was, sure enough, there was a public accommodation statute in the city of Chicago. So then, of course, we filed you know, complaints against all these places that prohibited women. So we filed the lawsuit. We did the direct action. We, you know, da 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 carried on. And... Um, you know, we won the law case, so I mean, eventually it actually did work. They got rid of them, and then, then the Chicago. We targeted the Chicago Tribune on the want ads. The want ads were men, and women, so we arrested the Chicago Tribune. We had a little paper <laughs> thing that we put in front of the Tribune, and we arrested them. We had a great debate over whether that made sense. You know, whether we should actually target a media source. There was some debate within the chapter whether we were biting the hand that feeds us, because we were getting all this great press on the public accommodation stuff, and would they turn against us if we went after them? But no, well, you know, we just, of course, did it anyway. But anyway, and it didn't, I don't remember that it hurt us as much. But, but anyway, so we did a lot of direct action stuff. And then the person who came to, the, on the religious stuff, Betty Farians, who actually is still living, she's in Cincinnati, she was on the faculty at Loyola and um, a very strong feminist. We had a meeting at my apartment, I remember. Betty Farians was there, and Mary Daly was there. So, I mean, it was kind of like, oh, my God. Um, she wasn't as radical as she became later, but still, I mean, it was, it was, you know, it was an indication of how much need there was in every level of the women. Of women. Now was kind of the thing for at least a year or two. Because that was where people wanted to go because that's what that's what existed. So now it's kind of captured that beginning. I remember in New York, um, uh, what's her name? I can't think of her name now. Anyway, uh, irrelevant. So, so anyway, we the the idea was to get as much activity going as possible to make ourselves as visible as possible. So. Um, you know, taking that guidance from National, but also, you know, getting our own sea legs about what we wanted to do. And we started a newsletter, and, you know, we had to get ourselves organized and collect our dues and whatever and whatever. So that was... Was there a president of the Chicago Now chapter? There had... Alita Styers was a president when I got there. Catherine Conroy had been for a, an earlier phase. And then Alita Styers was... And she was a banker. So... We sort of replaced her with me uh, the next year. Uh, there was an election then. So there was a little debate. In the, I mean, right from the beginning, you know, as with any organization, there's always debates about what you should do and what kind of activity. And she was a banker by trade. And so, you know, going and standing in front of the Chicago Tribune with a paper 
you know, chained to arrest the Tribune probably wasn't her idea of a good time. <laughs> so, so she anyway, was she wasn't too keen on that. So anyway, so we <laughs> had a, our little election, and, and so I was elected as president. Uh -huh. So I was the president in 69, and, and then in 1970, I mean, this is this enormous period of energy, you know, in the women's movement, or at least in now, and, and not just in now, in the whole women's movement. So then 1970, the convention, the National Now Convention was in, outside Chicago, was in a, at a, a hotel near O'Hare because we were still mad at Daly for beating up everybody in 1968, so we didn't want to be downtown Chicago. So we d agreed to meet out at O'Hare. And at this time, the National Now was located where? New York. New York. Right. And was Betty Friedan head of it? Betty Friedan was the president. Okay. So, so a couple of things are going on. The bylaws are being rewritten. There's a lot of, Betty had a lot of concerns about the New York chapter and it's spinning into a more radical place than she wanted it to go. <coughs> Honestly, probably some concern about the, the lesbian presence at that point in the New York City chapter. <coughs> so she actually came into Chicago hoping that she could move the office to Chicago. Oh, Betty did? Mm -hmm. oh, okay. so, um, so there was a lot of politics already in, around a lot of things, as there always ha has been and now. So anyway, so we had, um, there was this new regional structure adopted. There were four regional directors. And then a bunch more officers. There had been just four officers, I think. And now there was a legislative vice president, a legal vice president, PR vice president. And there were like eight or nine executive officers. So, um, and Betty was going out of office. But Betty was, you know, making her exit speech. So she had been flying, been on an airplane with somebody who, mentioned to her that August 26th was the anniversary date when Tennessee ratified the Equal Rights Amendment. Uh, ratified the right to vote, I'm sorry, the right to vote. So she got it in her head that she would, she gets up there, she doesn't talk to the new president coming in, Eileen Hernandez, she doesn't talk to anybody. And she gets up there and announces that there will be, this is March 31st, okay, that there will be a national strike of women. They will, women will leave their jobs, they will, leave their kids, they will, whatever they will do. And we will have, on August 26th, the anniversary of women, the 50th anniversary, we will have this national strike. And we're like, what? You know. Um, but it was, ay, ay, ay. I mean, Eileen was furious. I mean, a lot of people were furious. But you know what? She Who told us Eileen? to, Hernandez. Hernandez, she was the incoming was president. Incoming. She probably wanted to decide what the organization might do in the year she was the president, but hey, uh, you know. Uh, so Betty announces this women's strike. So it was, it was that naivete of newness. You know, we were all like, okay, Betty told us we have to do this. I guess we have to do this, even though it doesn't sound too sensible. So, so in Chicago, I mean, speak for Chicago, New York had a big, they had 50,000. We had 25,000. We really did. So anyway, we all got together and tried to figure this out. We were always interested in having relationships with, with other organizations. We were good at we were good coalition builders, and that's partly because of Catherine Conroy. Catherine Conroy was a labor leader, so she was always interested in labor being a part, trying to bring more labor people in. Then, you know, we knew Heather and some of the women from the Women's Liberation Union. And then somebody from daycare and somebody from this and that. So we put a, uh, so we decided to do this rally at the Civic Center before it was a daily plaza. And so we got the Civic Center lined up. And, you know, again, we, and we, Marianne did the, that button, don't iron while well, the strike is hot. And we did the posters and we did whatever and whatever. And, and very importantly, Joanna did this press, and the press was now coming from around the country, too. Muriel Fox was a PR person in New York. And um, it was a convergence of people laughing at us, 
thinking this was the stupidest thing they'd ever heard, and of course that no one, no women would ever strike. So there was all these articles: Will women strike? Front page of the the Sun Times, you know, just these banner headlines in the week, the couple days before. You know, we're trying to get people to this thing. Well, I mean, never in my wildest dreams did I think that the plaza would be filled. Never, never, never. But because of all this publicity that the press really created, they created our crowd because everybody came on their lunch hour. We were, that was a smart thing. We picked the lunch hour. <laughs> and so everybody's on their lunch hour. It's a beautiful day. It's the middle of August. Da, 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 da. And here they all come and there's like 25,000 people looking at us. I got up there. I was you know, running the, 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 the program. <coughs> and I, I just couldn't believe it. So there they were. And, um, I mean, it, it transformed the organization. It transformed the women's movement, I think. I mean, it became more of a national phenomena. The membership doubled that day. Just doubled. People just signed up. Not that it was big to begin with, but it doubled and, you know, the impact was tremendous. And the public relations impact and the impact around the world. I mean, the pictures went around the world and whatever. So, you know, good old and Betty, it did have an impact. And did people actually strike? I mean, did they not go to work? Very few. Uh -huh. There was one woman, this was, I don't know if this happened elsewhere, but in Chicago. So we're, you know, dead tired and it's almost the end of the rally. <coughs> this woman comes up to the podium with her child. She has brought her child to work, as Betty said, and she's been fired from the Morel Meat Pack Meat Pro Meat Company, and it's on LaSalle. So it's like, so Judy Lonquist, lawyer. So we announce that this woman has lost her job and that we're marching over to the Morrell offices. So here we go. It's at the end. I mean, a lot of people have left, but I mean, I'll never forget this. So we're marching over with this woman or baby to LaSalle Street, and now there's several thousand people on LaSalle Street. That's the noise of, of chanting on LaSalle Street with those tall buildings was deafening. I'm sure that guy was like, oh, what have I done? So they march, Judy Lonquist and the woman with her baby march up to the guy's office. Well, big surprise, she got her job back instantly. So that was great victory. So it was, it was a moral victory. Okay, so that gave us a series of stories too. I mean, all of that gets a big, bigger hit in terms of people learning about this. And then the phone rings off the hook and, you know, we don't even have the organizational structure to really handle this level of participation. So, I mean, that was a big scramble to try to get more things going. I was elected the first Midwest Regional Director at that regional meeting. Um, Mary Ann Lupa took over as president, I guess. In 1970, was it? Yeah. So I, I think she was the vice president. So she took over as president, and I became the regional director. And I had a $100 um, budget in 13 states. $100 a year? Uh-huh, yeah. So and I got in my car. responsible for 13 states? 13 states. So, I mean, I would, you know, and this is no email, no nothing, right? Just phone and letters. So I just set about to start chapters in all these cities across the Midwest. So, you know, Cleveland, Cincinnati, and... You would go to the cities? I would go to the cities. Uh -huh. You know, I would find somebody, you know, I would look at the national membership, call somebody up, and um, they would be thrilled that the idea of the regional director was going to come. They would organize a meeting, and we would go there, and we'd start a chapter. And it did work. It did work. I mean, I don't remember ever having somebody say no. Because this is this waiting. I've been waiting for this. Where have you been? You know what I mean? There's, I remember this from reading some of the letters that came in to the national office. I'm so happy. You know, I've been waiting years for this. I'm, I just can't believe this. So it, it's really a nice, it was an amazing, it was an amazing need mm -hmm. for someone to articulate for women. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, the, you know, in all the book, um, Gail Collins' book and um, 
the woman who wrote the book on Betty Friedan, who actually, I actually like that book. Kermit's? Yeah. I mean, talking about these women, I mean, sending all these women to college, getting these great degrees, and then expecting them to do nothing was just an amazing, I mean, contradiction. And so when somebody said, hello there, no, 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 you don't need to stay home. You can get out and do something with your life, do something different with your life. There was a, a backwash of eagerness and people wanting to do that. And I mean, Ladke and those women, they were all young. And they worked at, you know, they were all college graduates. They were working at some Scott Forthman or wherever they were working. And, um, but I mean, they were so underutilized in their job. Mm -hmm. So they did now stuff all day long. I mean, they, they did. I mean, the, you know, because their jobs weren't that compelling because they were undervalued so much. I think that was part of it. So that's, I think, a difference between that early, very early period. And then as women got more utilized, then they got, their jobs became more compelling, et cetera, et cetera. Right. So it's a, just a different, but, but this kind of, it was like opening a floodgate of emotion and energy and intellect, and mm -hmm. the women just rushed in to try to make something of it. It was pretty amazing, mm -hmm. pretty amazing. Now that time, 1970, uh, and you were the president from, what was it, 69 to? 69 to 70, and then um, I became the regional director, yeah, right. and they, they had really short terms. It was like a year and a half. So in 72, Betty, want, Betty was going off the board, so I took her, I mean, I, that, op that opened a seat for me on the national oh, board, and that was, the regional director was a national board position. I mean, they had an executive committee, actually, it was kind of crazy. So president, vice president, two vice presidents, secretary, treasurer, four regional directors, and then a vice president for legislation, legal, PR, and maybe one, and finance. So I mean, they, they, they came out with a structure that was pretty top heavy, like 15 positions that were the executive committee. Mm -hmm. So anyway, that's, mm -hmm. but, but you know, we had Lucy Commissar was a PR person, Ann Scott, who was brilliant, Shakespeare scholar. She was the legislative vice president. I mean, it, it really, Brenda Festo, Brenda Feigen Festo, Feigen, I think she wrote a book under Feigen. She was the legal vice president. I mean, it was just these enormously impressive women, um, especially in these vice president positions and the president position. I mean, Eileen Hernandez was quite something too. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> she had been an EEOC commissioner. Um, so, I mean, it was an amazing group of people. It's just a conver an interesting convergence. I don't think I've ever seen anything quite like it in my life. Maybe there just hasn't been a period like that mm -hmm. where a combination of things. Mm -hmm. I'm sure the Civil Rights Movement was like that, too. It's like all this pent-up pent frustration up, right. of... And people who were dying to... Oh. Yes. Here was something that they could actually do. Absolutely. Yeah. So what happened to Chicago now during this time after this? What issues did they become involved in? What is the accommodation you were talking about? That was the early days. And that got solved, basically. The, the legally, we went to court and they were told they couldn't do that. And so they all, so Burgoff's yeah. integrated their... And, and there was a law on the Chicago in Chicago about mm -hmm. this, and it was the, was it an anti discrimination uh -huh. you couldn't discriminate uh -huh. in public accommodations. Uh -huh. Probably was passed. I'm sure it was passed by the civil rights movement, and somehow gender got in it. Okay. I mean, that would be an interesting story of who did that because that was unusual. I mean, if it was a bill passed, there was the original. Uh, what was that? The EEOC. Act when where they put in gender. Yes, at the last that was minute. a joke too. That right, was a joke. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. But this was a Chicago law. This is a Chicago ordinance, one seven six A, I believe, is the number. Okay. But anyway. Well, that's a story. We'll have to look up that. Yeah. 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 Judy Lonquist, um, is I have her number. She's in Seattle now, but she was a labor lawyer. She worked for a labor law What's firm. Her name? L O N N Q U I S T. Judith Lundquist. Right. She's a pistol. 
Um, and she's in Seattle now. She's in Seattle. I've got a, I'll give you her address after we get done with this. Um, so now let me think. Now, so I'm kind of off doing the, my organizing. Marianne's in the chapter. There were a couple things. I think at this period of time, you're going to have to check me on the facts here. Illinois was rewriting its constitution. Mm. So we were involved. Pat Polis was a member of the chapter, and she was active, P-O-L-I-S. She was very active on the um, constitution rewriting thing. Um, the chapter, con -con, right? huh? Con-con, con-con, exactly, con -con. right. So we, we did con-con. I don't remember exactly what our angle was, probably some women's stuff, probably getting neutral language or whatever the heck we thought was. I don't think we were trying to get the Equal Rights Amendment in at that point, but um, because it, the ERA passes Congress on March 27, 1972. So that becomes then a major um, activity of the chapter. The chapter was very smart about the, in the early days of the ERA campaign, they did something that's considered kind of modern warfare. They targeted one or two state legislators who had voted against the ERA, and they organized, and they backed somebody, and they beat the person. So it was like very sophisticated for a young group, you know, to be thinking like that. I'm sure we had a lot of help from other people, but we actually did it, and we actually got enough. You know, we looked at whoever, some guy who was voting against the ERA in a place where we had a lot of members, and we just, and somebody else was running against them, so we just organized and beat the guy. It was a pretty big deal. And did it you took, run a woman? <coughs> I don't think so. I think it was a guy. I think we ran whoever was running okay. at the time. But I mean, a lot of the women running, uh, uh, the ERA campaign, though it didn't, wasn't successful here, produced an, a whole generation of new women in elected office and, and raised up the women who were there, Giddy Dyer and Susan Catania and um, whatever those other women's names are that were active throughout the ERA campaign. Catania was a huge, Susan Catania, I don't, do you remember her name at I all? Do. Yeah. With her eight kids. She right. had eight kids? Mm -hmm. She was probably the first legislator to nurse on the floor of the General Assembly in Springfield. They were not happy. And it was at the time we had three member districts, so she was a Republican from Hyde Park. Hmm. She, I think it was Hyde Park, right around I, Hyde Park or South Shore. Because, I mean, it was a unique system that Illinois had, which I, I think was tremendous. They had three member districts, and only two, not more than two, could be from one party. So in the Republican districts, you had one Democrat, and the Democratic districts, you had one Republican. But the Democrat, the Republican in the Democratic district, was a moderate. You know, and probably the Democrat in the Republican district was probably more conservative. But anyway, it made a much more mellow state legislature. It got in the the con con that came later, and um, I think Quinn was involved in that. Anyway, they got rid of it. That was too bad. But so anyway, going back, so in the, in, I think you asked in the early 70s, the ERA, um, uh, employment discrimination, the Chicago chapter had, one of the things that we got going on right away was, and Lonquist was a part of this, and Charlotte Edelman was another part of this. We, and Mary Lynn Myers, who now lives in South Dakota, I think you might know her, of her too, um, we did, we set up this hotline and, off, yeah, and offered people to, I don't know if it was, a de it wasn't a dedicated line, but we advertised our, our, our phone number and we would offer to go with any woman who wanted to file a complaint with any agency, with the EEOC or with the state agency. And we actually did, we sent people with these women to take on their employer, we helped them write the complaint. We helped them. We helped them through figuring out how, how what kind of evidence they needed, et cetera, et cetera. And a lot of it was done by volunteer lawyers. It was a pretty uh, important service. And and then the agencies got to know our people, so it gave us access to 
on the enforcement side in a really good way. It was a really good strategy to do that. It's, it, it advertised us as a group that was very helpful <coughs> um, to women, not just feminists, but women who had job problems. And it, so it gave us wider access on an uh, area, on an issue we cared about, and, <coughs> and it provided something helpful. We also had, Lupa might remember this more, we filed, we represented a woman who worked for the city of Chicago, who worked for Mayor Daley, basically, who worked for the city. I can't remember what department she worked in, but we represented her. And we took the case through court, and she won and got back pay. So, I mean, we, we just were very diligent and moving along and trying to, we took it seriously, you know? You can't discriminate against women in the workplace. By God, we're going to make sure that you don't do it. So we just went about our business. And, and you were all volunteers. All volunteers. This is the amazing thing. Mm -hmm. We were all volunteers. We didn't get, I think we started an executive director position. Maybe when, maybe, maybe it wasn't that late. But, but the initial stuff was all done by volunteers. And then even when we got a, um, an assistant, um, I can't think of the woman's name. She actually came to Rollins. But she was the first staff person. Um, you know, we had to work through that. What did that mean? Because we had such a strong volunteer corps. I mean, people would give 20 hours. It wasn't unusual for somebody to give 20 hours a week to the cause because they felt so tangibly what they were doing and that what they were doing made a difference for people. It was pretty amazing. Pretty amazing. I'm sure this happens in other areas of volunteer work, but it's the most, you know, people felt they were both on the cutting edge, you know, they were doing something really politically important and pushing the envelope, but also, ser you know, service oriented, also actually helping the woman who's sitting in front of them. Mm -hmm. Because people used to fight about that too. Do you do service? Is that wrong? You know, and this was the, ra you know, rape crisis, all these services, the better women stuff, the rape crisis centers, all of those institutions come out of that period. You know, and there was some debate over whether we were supposed to actually just be helping people or, you know, doing the more political thing. But, I mean, those were important discussions too. And ultimately, I think what happened is some people did one thing. Some people started a rape crisis center. Other people ran for office or helped other people run for office. And so there was a sorting out eventually. Um, and I think why you had so many organizations develop out of. I mean, now had this big bowl of things that they did, but then people kept pulling things out because each thing, a rape, the rape issue was enormous. The credit issue was enormous. The better women's issue was enormous. The employment issue was enormous. And so all these, you know, a, a different organizations formed out of the now flower came a lot of buds, you know, that became you know, how women employed, I mean, now wasn't, they work together now and, the, and women employed work together, but women employed, you know, then took on that employment issue over the last 30 years in ways that now couldn't do. <coughs> so it's a multi-issue organization versus the kind of concentrated, which actually has allowed for women of many political stripes to be involved too, I think, you know, to have different you were talking about helping women file these claims. Yeah. Uh, who who actually did that? Was that a, a sort of a designated group, or was it a lot of different? <coughs> well, we had a committee, you know, and um, either Charlotte or Judy or whoever else would mostly attorneys. Then. Well, they would help us, though. I remember going. I went. Yeah. I mean, I remember going with a woman, uh -huh. and. Um, because they couldn't always be available during the day, and they you know, worked for. You know, I mean, so we would trade off, you know, who could go, and we had our committee that met, and then we would get the women in, and we would, um, somebody would meet with them and tell them how to file the thing. We got pretty good at it so that people could do it without the guidance of an attorney every time, but we always usually had the attorneys check and help us figure out and make sure we we're doing the right thing. So. You know, and most of them weren't going to go to court. They were just going to, they were going to be resolved internally in the agency, which is, 
you know, can be a very good thing. Right. Um, so it was pretty amazing. Mm -hmm. Pretty amazing. Um, now you talk about women employed. Yeah. And that got started in 73, was that right? I think that's 70, 72, 70, 73, 30. yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. And do you know something about how that got started? Day Kramer, um, who's now Day Piercy, who was, I mean, was born Day Piercy, but she was Day Kramer at the time. Um, you know, the Midwest Academy plays a role here because we're all getting trained by the Midwest Academy, which became a controversial issue, by the way, within now, which is another whole story. Okay. <clears throat> uh, when was the Midwest Academy started? Right that same time. Right at the same time. Right around that same time. I think it was, yeah. Right at the same time. I can look it up, but yeah. It's 72 or 73 and that also. And started by Heather, right? Heather. Heather and Paul. And, and the purpose was to train people. Um, yes. In the, organizing skills? Yes, in organizing. Um, uh, what's his name? The famous. Alinsky. Alinsky didn't believe that women should, could be organizers and didn't train them. So that was kind of the impetus for the Midwest Academy, um, among other things. I mean. Do you know why he thought they couldn't be? I don't know. I, I don't remember. I probably knew at the time. Okay. You know, his whole organizing thing was, well, a lot of it was church-based. I mean, that, right, that, right, that, a lot of it was Catholic church-based. Um, although Gail Sincata was, you know, the leader of, I thought she was Alinsky trained, so don't hold me to all of this. But, but that was, uh, at the time, there was a feeling that there was a need for the Midwest Academy, partly because the women weren't being adequately served by the tough guys in the Alinsky model. So they, and they did develop a different model. It's more organizational model. Um, I mean, the Alinsky model is pretty rigid. They do the same thing now that they did 40 years ago, you know, pretty much. Um, so anyway, but, uh, but it became controversial within now, but that's a whole nother story. Where were we? Well, we were just talking about the kinds of issues that now was uh, dealing with yeah. the, about the 1970, and then you right. became the regional director. And, right. And then we were talking about women employed and how that. Yes. I guess I'm, I'm kind of interested in. Well, I think. There. Yeah, Day. Uh, Day was also a founder of the Midwest Academy. I see. And so you know what I think honestly that the Midwest Academy was, had a, a theoretical basis, you know, on different skill, organizing skills and different organizing models. And Day was very interested in women's rights and in women, you know, working class women's, or not just working class women, women's equal opportunity. And so um, women employed became a model, a kind of model to see whether some of these skills, how these skills could be organized and used, utilized. So the women employed um, had a kind of direct action model at the beginning. And the Sears campaign that started with women employed, but then came over into, back into now. Um, and this is where these kind of ideas overlap. So the, th the, the strategies that Day created, and Anne was there pretty much from the beginning. She was having Anne Ladke involved, and, and Kathy ran. I mean, people provided leadership. She was, Day was the organizer, but she needed public faces that wasn't her. And so Kathy Rand did that, um, Anne did that, and some others. So they picked Sears undoubtedly for the same reason that the government had picked them, um, because they were the largest employer of women in the United States. No, they were the second largest. AT and T was the largest. Mm -hmm. So, um, so they started picketing Sears and handing out leaflets at Sears for discrimination. Yes, soliciting people to come, and they did come. So this was again a source of people to participate in this filing of charges kind of thing. Right. 
So Women Employed was doing that. We were doing it with them, and there was an, a tremendous overlap there. And, um, you know, out of that experience with, so, so Women Employed went on, did a lot of direct action. I mean, they had, they called, they did very much the, the Alinsky model. They called, they got the corporate guy to come to a meeting, and then they hollered at him. And, you know, I mean, that was, that was, uh, it, it was a kind of model. So anyway, they used that in the beginning. They don't use that, they don't do that at all anymore. They have a totally different method. But, um, but that was going, so there was a, a, a merger of the direct action and then the legal, because I mean, filing complaints and taking cases is certainly a le using the system as opposed to hollering at people. So there was a combination of things. And then what happened, let me leave that women employed for a moment, then within now, and partly with Heather's help, um, and Anne and I were the co-chair, became the co-chairs, we sold to the national organization the idea of going after Sears Roebuck as a national target. And the government had already targeted Sears Roebuck. So, and Anne Scott, who was the uh, legislative vice president, she was all for this. So we introduced this into the national organization. So we did the Sears campaign um, in 73 and 74 here. And so there was kind of a merger of activities between women employed and now in that period. And uh, we, fought, we identified all these women. And identified, from identifying the women, and then we just started to study this corporation. I mean, because it was a retail corporation, we could send, we did this all over the country. We made a little checklist. And we said to people, go to your store at, and put down the time of day and go to the, each department <clears throat> and count the number of when and the number of women who are the clerks in the department and the number of whites and blacks, or probably blacks, probably didn't even say browns. Just count them. Well, I mean, it's uh, the, what we knew and what we were trying to verify we knew that Sears was putting the men only in, men into the big ticket items, the washers and dryers and refrigerators, and the women into the socks. So they got their percentage, their, what do you call it, bonus, or whatever they call that. I can't remember what the term is. So that the men got a 7% bonus on a refrigerator, and the women got a 7% bonus on a sock. And that's how it was. And when we, we, we knew this was happening, but honest to God, to have people go there and observe and just write it down. I mean, it's very simple. You have eyes, you can see what color they are, what sex they are, what time, what department, period. Very simple. We just fed all this into the EEOC as a way of verifying what they were seeing mm -hmm. with their analysis. So hmm. it was pretty cool. Yeah. And it's a retail place. You know, we picked a retail place Precisely because you can see it and because it's vulnerable. Retail is vulnerable to public pressure in ways that somebody who makes a widget that somebody buys for a, to make another widget, they're not, they don't care. Mm -hmm. But if it's a retail, if it's anything the public buys, they're much more vulnerable to pressure. So that's why we picked them. It was pretty wild. Mm -hmm. so, so anyway, that was a, that was a good... Project and what what um, what deter what we what was determined by that research, not the not not so not the one at the store, but the one at the tower, was I mean they leafleted they would go out this is so beautiful they would go out at eight o'clock in the morning, and they would leaflet and there were no men coming in because the men didn't come till nine o'clock, so they would go from eight till nine they'd see no men. Then at 9 o'clock, I mean, this is the other thing this where you can visualize the at the tower. Then at 9 o'clock, the men start coming in. I mean, this wouldn't be true today, obviously. But, you know, and then talk to these women. They all had college degrees. They all had the same qualification as the men who were coming at 9. But they were called, the men were called assistant buyers, and the women were called buyer's assistants. And the women had a typewriter at their, their desk, and the men didn't. So it was the same qualification, but they were tra being tracked totally into a different 
system within the company with the same qualifications. So that's what the government ultimately got them on, was that job classification was the clearest one at the tower in the, in the management mm -hmm. programs. And when we smashed that, that was a big deal. It was a big deal. All this stuff is a big deal, really. Sure. It really is, yeah. Mm -hmm. So it became a national uh, Became a national campaign. Agenda. Yep. A national campaign. Right. And, uh, and you and Ann were the We were the co-chairs co of the national National Task Force. Task Force. <laughs> right. Yeah. The, the thing that became problematic or opportunistic or however you want to say it, I was running for president of now. And I ran on the Sears campaign. Mm -hmm. And I ran on the Sears campaign, 1974. So, so anyway, so not, now had at that time they had no um, anybody who came to a national convention and paid their dues could vote. So the opposition recruited, actually, literally recruited Sears employees to come because they were opposing me. So there were they like recruited Sears employees. Sears was actually there and voting against me. Oh. It's very interesting. But anyway, so I lost the election by about thirty-five votes. It was pretty wild. And the uh, person who won was Karen DeCurl. Karen DeCurl. So um, and Eileen Hernandez was a Sears consultant. I mean, so this is kind of. I haven't really told the story before, but well, Heather talks about it all the time. But anyway, so so it was a pretty interesting development. It also, I I, you know, I'm sure you have, yeah. Uh, so it's not, you know, but I, I'm 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 interested in whatever you feel like you can say, right? Because I, I do know that these things happened. Yes, they did happen, and so at some point we were, I mean, we were pounding Sears. So Eileen, you know, I'm sure she, ha she may have a totally clear conscience about this from her point of view. But anyway, she set us up a meeting with Arthur Wood, who was the head of Sears. So we actually had a meeting with Lonquist and me and Ladke and a few other people. We sat across the table from, from uh, Arthur Wood, who was like, you have no right to, you know, ruin the reputation of this company. You know, I mean, it was serious. So our demand was that they give us their affirmative action plan in writing. You know what? They finally did it. They did give yeah. it to you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Were all companies required to have one? Have one, but not give it to you. Not make it public. I, think. I mean, what we found about Sears, this is kind of a, an amazing thing. And, you know, we've got these books all being written on it, so it's going to be good. You know, it's going to be... Uh, people are going to know about this, but what we found, what the racism was as bad as the sexism. I, I mean, it was incredible. They didn't have any, at the tower at the time, there were no black people even working in um, cleanup. In the, mm -hmm. <coughs> they had all Polish cleaning ladies. They didn't even have black cleaning people. They had no one. I mean, it was no one. It was kind of shocking. It was pretty extreme. <laughs> and in the stores, I mean, all the, the there was this this inequality between the women and the men, but there were no black people either. I mean, we went down to Stony Island. I think there were like two black people in the whole store. It was completely black. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, it was just, it was shocking. Mm -hmm. It was it was shocking. It was shocking mm -hmm. to see this. But anyway, we tortured them. We went and testified in Congress. We went and testified. The government was holding some kind of hearings in St. Louis about poverty in America. We went and said Sears employees were eligible for relief, which they were, you know. But I mean, we just drove them crazy. It was great. It was great. It was a lot of fun. It was good, but it was a very it it showed what people can do. You know, whether it can still be done, I don't know. But it it it, it was what a what you know to to get at these big institutions. It's not easy, but I think some of these methods could be gone back to. I mean, mm -hmm. I really do. To, it's and and about, huh? it was, it's worth learning about how it was done. It is. I think it is too. Yeah. I mean, HRC, HRC Human Rights Campaign did it with Target. Target when Target was giving money to these anti-gay 
candidates in Minnesota. Mm -hmm. They went after him in a kind of retail way. So I thought that was interesting. But that's one of the few times that I've seen somebody actually, and you know, they back down because Target, you know, they can't afford to. I mean, anybody who sells to the public is somewhat vulnerable. But I mean, it has to be an issue the public cares about, too. So, anyway. Mm -hmm. The Sears thing went on and on. And, you know, Arthur Wood was also the chair of Nixon's campaign. Mm -hmm. Isn't that wild? Mm. Anyway. So, um, what was the relationship between Chicago Now and the National Now at this time? Well, Chicago Now, because, you know, when Betty you know, figured out how to move the office to Chicago. I mean, first and of all, that happened. that happened. We were in South Shore. Okay, and when was that? 1970. 1970. Betty moved the national Betty office. got them to agree to move the national office to Chicago. Okay. Which we were in South Shore. We were in South Shore. South Shore. 72 what, South Shore. Okay. In a storefront. Uh, I mean, it was... It was so much work, it was unbelievable. But it, my husband Jim and I, Jim Robeson, Jim Collins Robeson, and I was yeah, Gene Collins Robeson at the time. And so he, he, technically, I wasn't getting any money from this. I mean, this was, I was working as hard as he was. But because I was on the board, it would be a conflict of interest for me to get. So he was, the contract was with him, not with us. But that, you know, um, so so anyway, so then the office moved in 70, and then, you know, there was kind of a general assumption that I would be the president. And the Eastern people, I mean, it, there was a convergence of issues. We got, we asked, we had, a couple of us had gotten trained by the Midwest Academy, and we were excited about it. So we, we had the board... We had them train the board. The board came into Chicago, and we actually were in some godforsaken hotel in Hyde Park in the basement, whatever that was. Anyway, the room was in the basement. But anyway, so we had the Midwest Academy come train them and Heather and whatever. Well, some of the board members jumped on that as an opportunity to say that we were a bunch of socialists or communists. And so they spread that around that we were... We weren't, that Heather, you know, Heather was our leader and we weren't primarily interested in women's issues. We were primarily interested in socialist whatever. <clears throat> and so they set up that dichotomy, which we sort of played into in a way. And so then we went after the Sears campaign. Then um, some of the more corporate types, didn't. they didn't think that that was... I guess it was class-based to some extent. I, I mean, they just didn't, they didn't really, they wanted to do the Equal Rights Amendment. They wanted to do, um, they were much more interested in the Equal Rights Amendment, gay rights, you know, kind of pure, more pure issues than the, they, they didn't care that much about the employment issue. So I think it converged in a, it was both convenient to beat me politically, but it was also reflective of their philosophy that they didn't think that's what we should be doing. Mm -hmm. So it all blew up in Houston. And um, Karen was... 77? 74. Oh, 74. Okay. So Karen was elected, but all the rest of our slate was elected. Our slate was elected. So we had Karen with a hostile, completely hostile. The rest of the people were all completely hostile to her. So it was total war between 74 and 75. It was awful. And then 75 was a total war. Then Marianne, uh, Mary Lynn Myers ran as presidential candidate for, my, for what had been my slate. I ran as an independent because I, I thought the organization was going to blow apart, and I didn't think that was right. So at the time, I ran as a third-party person. They wouldn't have won anyway. But things were so ugly mm -hmm. that, anyway. And when Karen DeCrow became president, did... Uh, the now organization, National Now, stay in Chicago, or did it move? For that one year. As soon as 75, when 75 happened, then it all moved to Washington. It went to Washington. Right. Then Ellie came in as chair of the board, or, or whatever that, I guess that was her title, with with Smeal. 
Ellie was, Ellie was uh, Samil's, Samil was Karen's, you know, the real brains behind Karen and the real organizer behind Karen. So Karen was technically the president, but, and then Ellie started a model of paid officers. So they moved to Washington and they started having paid officers. She liked the union model where you were paid. <coughs> so that was the beginning of that whole change of structure. Um, I mean, I think two things happen. One the, one, the paid officers is a different model. Two, direct mail. People, you know, when direct mail started in the early 70s, I think, people didn't have to ask for money anymore. People didn't have to, or, you know, have to get members on their own. They were all being gotten by the mail, right? That's how most organizations function now, the national organizations. Is direct mail. You know what I mean. They just mail out a renewal request or and and cold prospecting. It's a huge business, yeah. and so the ACLU gives its names to now, and now gives its names to the political caucus, and the political caucus gives its names to Planned Parenthood, and they all share. It was actually the um, Anderson's campaign, his third party campaign, that this whole philosophy was developed by Roger Craver. And so he started this business, Kramer? Roger Craver. Oh, Roger Craver. Okay. Craver. He's in Washington. Okay. And um, he thought up this whole, or he figured out that you could actually just mail to people and they would send you money in a different, in a more organized way and a more strategic way. Mm -hmm. And there would be a huge business for somebody, and it was him. He made millions, millions of dollars on this. So now started doing their mail. I mean, this wasn't uncommon. But I think institutionally, you don't have to, you're getting your money through the mail, through these uninvolved people who just write you a check. Mm -hmm. So it's a, just a different model of organizing. And I think it's, um, I think it's had some good as aspects, you know, on organizations being able to get bigger, but I think it has some really downsides because the people aren't, they don't have to do anything except write a check. You know, they don't have to be involved. Mm -hmm. It's very different than that volunteer model we were talking about, mm -hmm. <coughs> where people had to put in there. The, the success of the organization depended on people actually doing the work. Mm -hmm. It really doesn't with these direct mail things. You know, it just doesn't. Right. You hire professionals to professionals run the thing for you. It. Totally. Yeah. So it's just a really different model. Right. So anyway, I think that convergence it happened at that time. Anyway, 75 was a disaster. It was an awful convention. It was and, and that was anger in Philadelphia. Philadelphia. Right. And was there a convention every year then? Year to year and a half. Okay. They've changed the bylaws. I mean, like Kim Gandy was in seven or eight years. I don't know quite how that happened. But anyway, they changed the bylaws so that mm -hmm. the officers would stay in longer. But they're all paid people. So they're... Now, I went back and I ran for vice president. I was a paid person too, so I... Shouldn't complain about it, but vice president of national national action. National action. After um, this was leap forward here a long time after the ERA campaign, um, I was very active on the last 1980, the last ERA campaign here, and then I decided I would maybe run again in for national now. So in '82, I decided to run for vice president. I, I was thinking about running for president. I talked to Ellie, and um, I'm, not that I was running with her. I, I, well, yes, no, that, that's not true. Ellie was backing Judy Goldsmith, and so she said, why don't you run as her vice president? And then there were slates at that time. Um, and there were four candidates, so I won by, like, four votes. So... So when we, so in 82, that was when the election was, it was in Indianapolis, and Ellie, not that she liked Manny better than she ever did, but she, there was somebody else running that she didn't want to win, Ginny Fode, who was from California. Um, so she thought I was the best person to beat Fode. So she was all for my running for that. So anyway, um, so I did run and win and moved to, that's when I moved to Washington. Now, Judy Goldsmith, you mentioned her before. Yes, she was president. She had become, she's from Wisconsin. Yes. She had become, she was vice president uh, 
with Ellie Smeal's second term, or maybe both terms, vice president. And then she was, Ellie didn't, Ellie was ineligible to serve again, or, I, or she didn't want to. I can't remember. I, I, I don't think she was eligible. So she, she backed Judy Goldsmith to run. And um, so anyway, Judy and I ran together. And the two of us were elected. And then three of the five officers were, again, they had changed the structure and eliminated all those vice presidents. So they had a structure of five president um, Vice President Action, Vice President Executive, Secretary, and Treasurer. So there were five. And our slate won three of the seats, and two of the seats were run by other, <coughs> won by other people. So that was my second term, from 82 to 85. <coughs> and then Ellie didn't want us to be in anymore, so she ran somebody against us, and that was the end of us. She's a good organizer, I'll tell you. Got to give her credit for that. And she's still president, right? No. Oh. She runs the feminist majority. Oh, oh, okay. Completely. Here's a direct mail thing. I mean, there's, right, right, right nothing else. Um, so she's yeah. still active as an individual kind of. I mean, the feminist majority is an, it, it is an organization, but it doesn't do a lot as an organization. But it does keep her in the limelight and keep her. She, she lobbies on a few things in Washington, so. So that's kind of where now is. I think now is, you know, pretty much run its course at this yeah. point. Mm -hmm. When do you think it started being maybe irrelevant? Or <clears throat> well, I mean, I think as I think you know, once it decided, and and I certainly served during this time, but once it or at following this time, once it decided to do the ERA in the great intensity that it did. It became the main issue. It became of almost the only issue, really, national. that not not national did. So that was over in '82, and that's when I came in. And the direct mail guy, Roger Craver, he wanted us to keep to reintroduce the ERA and keep going as a fundraiser on the ERA. I was like, no way. I'm not doing that. So. But it was really hard. First of all, they had bankrupted. I mean, the organization was depleted of resources trying to pass the ERA. So, and, and no issue, which is why, from his point of view, it was a, probably legitimate to say, look, you've got to raise some money around something. You know, and, and if you don't raise around the ERA, everybody else has taken the other territory, other organizations. So I said, no, we should raise money around abortion, and we should be activists around it. So that's what we did. And we got a, I mean, we didn't do terribly financially, but I mean, now has never been the powerhouse that it was during the ERA. I mean, the ERA was a pretty intense campaign, I think, by the last two years. I mean, if Ellie had, if they had been willing to kind of, I don't know, do, after they lost in 1980, when it was clear they were never going to get it. But I mean, she kept it going until 82. My God, it was like, Oh, that's exhausting. So I don't know. I mean, I just don't think that. that anyway, so I, I don't think, at least from my point of view, it was really, I couldn't think of a way to really make a transition to where now could take on another issue that would make it prominent. So we worked on, we worked on a bunch of issues. We had a pretty good lobbying operation. And, and at that time, Congress still cared about now. I mean, now had enough members. You know, that you could, and we had a, um, the national secretary was um, Kathy Webb, who's from Arkansas. She's the first openly gay elected official in the state of Arkansas. She's still in now. And she was into organizing, and she, you know, tried to get members active um, around the legislative issues that we were doing. So we had a fairly active membership at that point, but... I don't think it ever, I don't think after the end of the ERA it ever got itself back into a place of prominence. Mm -hmm. And I just think it kind of goes on, and a lot of people respect the name. And, but. Yeah. Um, do you want to talk about ERA in Illinois? Sure. 
<laughs> Were you involved with that? Yes, I was um, co-chair with Linda Miller in the 1980 campaign. I came back in and became president of the Chicago chapter in 79 because I wanted to be involved in the ERA campaign. I had worked at the Illinois Nurses Association from 75 to 79. So I went back to do the ERA. Uh, I mean, Ellie was running the campaign because she was in the, she came into the state to run it and raised a lot of the money and stuff. But, um, you know, and she was, ugh. I mean, it was a big campaign. It was, it was a big noisy campaign. Um, I think if we hadn't had the three-fifths, we might have been able to do it, but with the three-fifths, we just, there was no way. We were, you know, we came close, but, I mean, Phyllis Schlafly is also a very good organizer. She was amazing. I mean, in, in that, she found our weak, the biggest weakness, well, it was abortion, but that wasn't so much here. It was the draft, I mean, she, uh, the military. Hmm. And I remember there was a hearing on the ERA, and Phyllis Schlafly brought her troops. She had one draft-age girl from each county. And so her, her, the way she used her testimony time, each girl got up and said, I'm from Cook County, and I don't want to be drafted. Sit down. I'm from LaSalle County, and I don't want to be drafted. Sit down. I'm from <laughs> County, and that was it. That was the whole thing. I thought it was one of the most powerful things I've ever seen. We had all these high lawyers and whatevers and whatevers. Decided to protect the girls. It was very effective. Anyway, it was, you know, it was a great campaign in the sense that a lot of young women got a lot of political training. A lot of, as I said, a lot of women ran for office. A lot of women went to Springfield, saw the caliber of some of the people who were sitting in those seats, decided that maybe they could do that too. So, I mean, it did, it did educate a lot of women about politics and about the importance of being involved and stuff. So I, I would never say that it wasn't worth the time and effort, but it, um, I mean, it led now down a single path. Um, but anyway, so. so it was pretty wild. It was a wild campaign. And a lot of money got raised. I mean, a ton of money got raised. So. Well, one of the things that we're interested in in the project is what makes Chicago unique or different in terms of the women's movement. Mm -hmm. So much has been written about the coasts mm -hmm. uh, in my shel shelves of books. You know, uh, uh, g writings generally about the women's movement are usually about New York or yep. LA or whatever. Very little about Chicago. Yep. And so that's the purpose of our project is Good. to try to document what went on here. And one of the questions that we ask is, how was this different? Do you have any ideas about that? Yes, I think I think Chicago is different. The Chicago women's movement is different in some ways the way Chicago is different. Mm -hmm. That the history, a lot of the history of America in Chicago is a history of struggles for opportunity, the labor movement, um, the Hull House, you know, the, um, what do you call that movement? Settlement. Yeah, settlement, settlement movement. A, a lot of the, the public health initiatives came out of here. Very practical, um, objectives, uh, a lot of it r really rooted in people and work-a-day work -a people, ordinary people. Um, I felt that about the, the efforts that we made in, around the employment issue and the Sears campaign and the AT&T campaign, that um, we were trying to, uh, it, the, irrespective of about whether that woman who was working at Sears, whether she was a feminist or believed in whatever three things you wanted her to believe in. If she was a woman and she was sitting at a desk and she was qualified for a job, then we ought to be with her. We ought to be on her side. 
So we cared. I think there's a there's an initiative that really is more based on the practical impact and the actual. Um, I don't know if this, am I making does this make any sense? It's just, um, I I mean I think the employment based, and the, I'm saying that and I'm thinking about Frances Perkins biography. Certainly, she did uh, a lot of the settlement people in the East did that as well. Yeah. But but I think it was more rooted here in. Um, the labor movement here and the women's work movement, I think it's just really kind of the basis of, we just, we just sort of grounded ourselves in the same thing that was the reality of our city and our town and the community around here. So we tried to, right, tried to do stuff with the labor movement, the civil rights movement. You know, there was a lot of consciousness about having it be a multiracial movement right from the get-go. Even if we didn't always succeed, there was certainly a sense of that. Um, so I think it's different in the way that, you know, we're kind of different in different parts of the country. I mean, I, I, I would guess some of the initiatives in the, southern, in the southern states by feminists were different, you know, because of the, where they lived and what they had to cope with and what they learned from their own experiences. So I think in, in the Midwest, I think in Chicago particularly. The other part of it <clears throat> is the political, being very political, very political and political, not in a pie in the sky way, but in a practical way of trying to actually get people into office and trying to get things done. I mean, I think it's interesting the Chicago chapter on the ERA campaign, they chose as one of their strategies to actually get into the electoral process and actually try to beat somebody who was against them and try to elect people who were for them. So they, you know, wasn't just going and giving speeches or trying to teach people about the issue, which we certainly did too, but we wanted to, we went right to the practical of trying to actually change the guys in the seats as a way to actually achieve our goals. Mm -hmm. Not that we were successful everywhere, but... And in terms of that strategy, um, how did uh, how did that evolve? Who, who sort of pioneered that in Chicago? Well, I, I remember that Lonquist decided to run herself. She was very much. I wasn't originally for the political strategy as much. I was more a little. I was more. Isn't that funny? Because I'm doing politics all my life. But I was a little nervous about you know, getting involved, uh, kind of being taken off of our basic issue campaign. But then Lonquist, who else? Some of the, you know, some of the political women like Pat Polis joined now. And they, so they came in and they argued for that point of view, that strategy of being more political and getting more politically involved. And when we got involved in ConCon, at first I was like, why should we do that? And then, you know, began to see. And it's the difference of, of, under, of being willing to sit at the table and being part of the decision making and being, trying to be a part of the governing and the, or the, the going inside the government, trying to do something practical, um, as opposed to just standing, always standing outside. I mean, God knows we have these fights every day in the Democratic Party about purity and whether or not somebody's good enough and whatever. So I'm, I guess I'm always, I feel like Chicago is more inclined toward the practical and maybe that's my personality too, but mm -hmm. I think it's. Uh... So there was the labor movement and um... Catherine Conroy, you mentioned, right. was an important figure. Uh, and what was her influence on, on now, do you think, on Chicago? Well, she started the ch first Chicago chapter, and then she was always active in the chapter. And she, you know, she was both active in the chapter and always, she did two things. She tried to pull labor people into being sympathetic to now, but she also tried to get the now people to understand the importance of the labor movement. 
So in January of 1970, before we had this national conference, we had this conference on employment, and we did it. She helped us do it, and we we put together. We had Shirley Chisholm was our speaker, and um, so we knew enough to do that politically. That was interesting. Anyway, so but anyway, so we did this this employment was conference Shirley, Chicago. in Chicago. Um, and 300 people came. So, I mean, it was reinforcing of who our... Who were the people that came? You know, I don't... I, I mean, they came from... Some of them were from labor unions. Some of them were our members. Some of them were from other women's groups. Um, you know, and we did these workshops on how to... Oh, it was very early. Yeah. It's incredible. Yeah. Um, so, real early on... <coughs> Chicago now right. was involved with this whole employment, mm -hmm. employment thing. Mm -hmm. And that was even before Clue and everything. Totally. Oh, it was before Clue. I was at the Clue founding conference here. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But that, I think a huge piece of that is, is Conroy's influence. Mm -hmm. And um, And Conroy was from Wisconsin? She was born in Milwaukee. Yeah. And she was CWA. And then she, um, she got to this regional position. And then she ran for vice president, which is an elected position, and the men beat the crap out of her. Vice we president all, of, CWA. of CWA. She didn't win. Uh, we tried hard to, we tried, you know, we worked with her and tried to, we made her buttons and stuff. It was very, she was amazing. She's an amazing, amazing woman, just amazing. And she was so, there were so few. She came, she came out of the Catholic Worker Movement, Dorothy Day's movement, you know, and there was Catholic Worker people in, in Milwaukee, and that's how she got involved in the labor stuff. And she was Catholic. And she was Catholic. Okay. And so she, Father Blydorn, Father Blydorn was active in the Catholic Worker Movement. Father Blydorn was also the pastor of Father Gruppy's church. Mm. Just how these things, and, you know, segment together. So, um, so yeah, she grew up in Milwaukee and, uh, and then came down here and then ran for vice president. But she spent a lot of time with us and she spent a lot of time with the women's movement. I mean, she's very dedicated to the women's movement. But she also was a very, she had a great influence on me and everybody around her, I think, because she never gave up on anybody. She wouldn't fall, she wouldn't let, we did, but she she tried hard not to have people fall into these I hate the other side kind of positions. Yeah. She was very, tried very hard to create understanding, not in a wussy way, but in a really, no, you know, see the other side and mm -hmm. and find solutions. You know, when everybody else is up and railing about what's wrong with the other person's position. She's always the one coming in and looking for the solution. Mm -hmm. You know, how can we word this differently? How can, you know, in these crazy fights we would have on the floor, she would always be there with her pad. Wow. <coughs> I tried to rewrite something. We were trying to come up with a compromise. I mean, she was older than we were, <coughs> so that helped. Um, but she was also very, it was her instinct to be. So she was involved with Chicago now until when? <coughs> until she went back to Milwaukee. Let's see. Chicago now. Um, where was she when I was going off? You know, she wasn't, I don't think she was at the 74 convention. So she was already out of, I don't think she was. I don't remember her being there. So I think she went back to Chicago, uh, to Milwaukee. That's where she retired. But I think she worked there for a while. I think she was, you know, after she ran for regional director, maybe they shuffled her back to a state position. I can't remember mm -hmm. exactly that, mm -hmm. what the sequence was. Because I think it was in that same period that she ran for vice president. Mm -hmm. And then she was probably near retirement. At yeah, time. yeah, that's what I think. Yeah, she went back there, and then she worked with a lot of the young women, you know, in the labor movement there, 
I mean, she had all her little mentors there. Mm -hmm. um, one of them, Annie Crump, I just saw her this last weekend. I mean, she she became, she got Catherine's old job with the CWA. Oh. She had it for about 20 years. Mm -hmm. But she grew up with, with Conroy. Did you know Addie Wyatt? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. At what point did you connect with Addie Wyatt? Do you know? <laughs> Well, see, I think we connected with Addie Wyatt through Conroy mm -hmm. because she was meat cutters. Right. Um, so I think she, I think Addie Wyatt was at that January conference, that that employment conference. Clara Day was Clara Day Teamsters. Did you ever hear her name? I've heard her name. She was at the Teamsters Clara Union. Day. Clara Day, black woman. She was a black woman. She spoke at our 1970 convention. I mean, our our thing. The strike day, women's strike day. Clara Day spoke for the labor movement. She was a teamster. Yeah. And now Conroy pulled that off. Now that was pretty amazing. We had somebody from the Chicago Women's Liberation Union. We had some, you know, we had a bunch of, oh, you you may know this woman. What was um, Al Raby's wife's name? Oh, Patty Nova? Yes. <laughs> she spoke that day on, ch on child care. At the, at the, no, at the, this was at the big rally, the big women's strike day. Oh, okay. Patty Novak spoke on child care. On child care. Yeah. Anyway, we had seven or eight speakers on different issues, but we were coalition oriented. I mean, that's, you know, that was a little bit of a fight now, too. You know, now had to be uber alles. And we, that isn't how we approached it. Mm -hmm. We loved our organization, but we also wanted to win. I mean, you don't win by fighting with everybody all the time. You know, you right. just got to, at some point, you have to, you can see I'm a Barack Obama supporter. But anyway. Yeah. <laughs> Were you always a Barack Obama? Always. From the time I saw him speak, that was the first I'd heard of him. I was like, oh my God. No, I, yeah, I didn't support Hillary over him. I supported him. Anyway. Um, well, I'm just trying to link up some things here. Um, you know, there, the, clue, the big clue conference, mm -hmm. a coalition of labor union women, mm -hmm. was here in Chicago in 74. Right. I, think. I was at that. Yeah, and you mm -hmm. were there. Mm -hmm. And um, <coughs> Olga Madar, who was UAW, there? head of it, first head of clue, I think. Okay. Olga Madar. Olga Madar. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. I think she was. And Addie, was, and Addie was, was the vice, vice president. She was the vice president, right? Yeah. So, tell me something about that, Conroy. How did you happen to go to that? Conroy. Mm -hmm. You know, she was part of organizing that, definitely. I mean, she was always organizing the women inside of the labor movement. And, you know, they were, some of them were a sorry lot, I must say. You know, the people who had made it to the top and were like, don't talk to me about this feminism. So she, you know, she, but she identified the people. Oh, yeah. yeah. A few women, very few. Oh, my God. I mean, the labor movement was about as bad as, it was worse than the corporations in terms of the involvement and presence of women. It was terrible. Mm -hmm. So, so Conroy was part of organizing Clue, definitely. And, um, I mean, this is the other thing that you may know or might be in the annals somewhere, but the first office of now, now it was organized in 1966. The office was at 8000 Jefferson in Detroit, Michigan, which is the national headquarters of the United Auto Workers. Mm. And I'm, I'm, I have a secret belief that, um, what's his name? The head of the UAW at the time. Lewis? No, can't think of his name. Anyway. The, and Caroline Davis was the national secretary of now, and she was, she was an officer of the UAW in Detroit. So Davis, so Dorothy Hainer, Caroline Davis, who were founders of now. Olga Madar wasn't a founder, but she was there. So uh, the UAW was the most liberal union, and had a lot, and and had the most women in prominent positions, and they were very prominent in getting. Now off the ground, definitely. Walter Ruther. Walter Ruther. I think Walter Ruther helped get now started, but somebody else will have to tell that story because I don't know it. But mm -hmm. I mean, the first, why did they have the first office at 8000 Jefferson in Detroit? That's where not the first now office is. Hmm. 
So it's and just fun. And that was fun. national. Yeah. That's amazing. Isn't it? No, it could be just coincidental that Caroline Davis signed up at the same time and said, "Well, I'll, 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 I'll be willing to take, you know, take the membership checks." Maybe it's that coincidental. Yeah, that kind of sure. But I just yeah. think it's interesting. Now, how about Catherine Clarenbach? Clarenbach is an amazing person too. She was, um, you know, the head of the Commission on the Status. She was on the faculty at the University of Wisconsin at Madison. Right. And. Um, she was the head of the Commission on the Status of Women. She may have started in the commission. In Wisconsin. In Madison, yes. Yes, in Wisconsin. Okay. okay. Then I think at some later time she was the head of the, the coordinated commissions on the status of women from all the country, from the whole country. Oh. She was really smart, very committed to women's issues. She was at that founding meeting. And when Betty Friedan was uh, chosen to be the president, she was. They created a position chair of the board because they knew Betty couldn't organize herself out of the bathroom. So they, you, you know, they wanted somebody in charge who was. And again, this is another thing. The Midwesterners kind of took over the organizing of this. Con, uh, Clarenbach, Conroy, and there were two other people here, which I can't remember their names in Wisconsin. But anyway, I mean, the Midwest people sort of took over the. Paperwork, you know, getting the thing actually organized while Betty's off making the speeches. So that's kind of how they saw the distinction, I think. But anyway, Clarenbach was the chair of the board, so she would try to keep order in these crazy meetings. Where, so she she did that. She was in for the first three years, same as Betty. She had a big impact in she and Conroy in getting the thing actually getting bylaws, getting them printed, getting them distributed, getting some measure of organization within the organization. Were the, was the president and the uh, president of the board uh, elected at that point <clears throat> by the members? By the board. Oh, I mean, at, at the initial, they didn't have any members. They didn't have any, so. But then, but they quickly, but then I went to the 1967 convention, which is where they hammered out all their positions, or not all of them, but the initial positions. So they took a position, and Betty was the president, they took a position on abortion. Um, Alice Rossi was the person who made the argument. Um, and so, you know, a bunch of people walked out. Then they, then they considered a position on the Equal Rights Amendment. And um, so they took that position. And then the labor people walked out, except Catherine. Of course, it's like, oh, they'll be back. Um, <laughs> You know, so it was this defining of all these principled positions, but they were <laughs> losing. I thought, is there anybody going to be in this room by the time we get done here? So anyway, it was kind of funny, but that's that's how it worked. I mean, they, they there's always been that tension. There's always that tension, and maybe I think there is in any movement between taking the principled position and being actually able to win anything because you can organize anybody. And if you lose every, you can have your most principled position, but if nobody follows you, then, you know, you're, guess what? You're not going to win. Right. So, but I think it was right in that, in that case. I mean, they took a position on abortion that was to the left of Planned Parenthood's position on abortion. I mean, it was pretty amazing. I mean, people weren't talking about making abortion legal in 1967. Right. And they took that position. No laws governing abortion. That's pretty wild. That was pretty wild. Yeah. And then the ERA, I'd never heard of the, I had no idea what they were talking about. Talking about. Yeah. You know, I read something, a little thing on Betty Friedan. It was a little booklet on her. Not, you know, the standard yeah. ones. And um, it talked about Catherine Clarenbach, and it said that originally she was made the president but that the East Coast people and Betty Friedan had such a fit that they got together and worked it out and it ended up that she was president of the board. And oh, I had never heard that, but it could, I mean, it could happen. Could have happened. I just thought that was kind of interesting that, that the Midwestern people were really sort of doing it. <laughs> no, I think that's right. And, and no, it's true. But, it's true. But Betty, you know, wanted to have the main position. I don't think Midwest people are as bigoted against the East as the Eastern people are against us. 
I really do. Or the Western people. I think they all think we're a bunch of, not they all, but I mean, that's an exaggeration. But I mean, I think there is a, a, a sentiment that the Midwest is not where uh, cutting the, edge the, ideas. the, yeah, totally, the cutting edge ideas are. And that's not, I don't think that's true. I, I don't know if it's true or not. I don't think it's true. I mean, I think a lot of... Well, that's what we're interested in looking at is, you know, yeah. what are the roots? I mean, if, if the, uh, the idea of the women's movement doesn't take seriously employment issues, right. then, you know, they're not going to see the work that was done here. No. No, exactly. Uh, so... Well, that's why I wrote up this, you know, Marianne and Kathy and I wrote up this um, proposal for the Alverno thing, and it's all, I, we wrote it about employment issues, because I think it's the most underrepresented area of achievement. I mean, just this one example that we talked about of this one job description at Sears Roebuck, the fundamental idea that a corporation can take college graduates and put them on on the men's room and the women's room track right. and that that's not can't happen anymore not that now did that by itself the government you know needed to reinforce it but we uncovered that I mean the the little picketing that well, the women employed now people did to really get the goods on on what was actually happening from the individual you know, uh, employees really get an understanding of how that tracking was deliberately, intentionally being done. That was pretty amazing. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's sort of like uh, my friend Lois Hur, you know Lois, who wrote the she book on AT&T. AT right. I mean, reading her book and... She was head of uh, now in DuPage County, was that it? <coughs> right, right. She was founder of uh, DuPage County now. She was out at the Bell Labs. Um, she and her husband were at Bell Labs, and um, but I mean, when she, when I talked to her and read her book and stuff, the the treasure trove when AT and T when the government came to AT and T and said, you know, turn over your documents, they were like, fine, you know, and here's documents that say they pick women for for operators because they have smaller hands. They they don't even know there's anything wrong with this, right. so. You know, they didn't even know that was something they shouldn't be doing. Mm -hmm. So the fundamentalness of, you know, some of this work. In the AT&T case, I mean, it was a government case, but we went out and, you know, we picked it at AT&T and Illinois Bell and Ray Stell and mm -hmm. all of that. You know, it both, it was directed toward the management, but it was also directed toward the employees, toward the women to begin to get, to help the women surface their own dissatisfaction with what they were being offered right. and to let them see. It's Consciousness raised. Totally. Yeah. That there could be another way. Right. Right. So. Well, is there anything else that you feel like that's uh, important, that you feel is important to talk about in terms of your experiences in Chicago, maybe, specifically? I can't think of anything. Okay, we've covered a lot of areas. Right. Um, t tell me about the, uh, the organizing uh, conference for CLUE. For coalition of labor union women, you said you were there. I was there. Yeah. What was it like? Well, it was pretty amazing. I mean, it was the first time the women had. I remember, you know, I, I remember there was a lot of excitement. There were a lot of people there. I I can't remember how many, but it was at that hotel down on the lakefront that we used to have all our meetings at. That labor, uh, whatever, doesn't matter. Um, but. Uh, a lot of great speeches, a lot of great workshops, and people coming from all over. I think, I can't remember whether the labor unions were kind of forced to send their people. I think they might have been, so the, the women got their way paid to be able to come. I think that happened. So that, I mean, I think clue happened. The, the labor guys were smart enough to know that they shouldn't let this get out of hand. So I think they paid so that there was 
quite a large contingent, more than you would get if people had to spend their money to come from wherever they came from. I think so they, they tried to sanction Clue so that it didn't get away from them. So it was a pretty big convention. Um, I heard 3,000. I think that sounds right. I think that and sounds they right. they didn't expect anywhere near that. Yeah, place. no. So, I mean, no. it just was way, way beyond yep. what we thought. Yeah. You know, and the labor women are, st I mean, labor women have made some progress. Unfortunately, the labor movement is not hanging together as much as we'd like it to, but I mean, we have, what, two major unions with women presidents, at least two, the CIU and AFT. So, I mean, at least we have now women presidents of unions that are enormously women. Mm -hmm. I mean, the teachers. I mean, NEA had a woman president a couple of years ago. So, but I mean, those barriers, they were tough to, you know, the, I mean, the watching this thing in Wisconsin where Scott Walker was, you know, when he put in his repressive collective bargaining bill, he excluded the cops and the firemen because he knows they vote Republican. And fortunately, you know, they, they said no, they want to be included in the labor movement. So that was a big switch. But I mean, that's the tradespeople were tough not to crack. You know, the fire and they were terrible to the women who got hired at the beginning. Terrible, terrible, terrible. So, mm -hmm. yeah. this is progress. This is progress. Right. Yeah. But it's, these are failing institutions. That, and I mean, had the labor movement been able to, to actually open up more generously to women at that per critical period in the 70s, maybe they would have got more members. I don't know. Well, what do I know? But. I always felt that was unfortunate. They're, they were not, you know, they kind of fought this stuff every step of the way, too. Remember, the IBEW was on the other side of the AT&T case, mm -hmm. <clears throat> fighting for their guys, so. Okay, well, this has been wonderful. Oh, it's there, been wonderful. Is, is to... Anything you want to say in conclusion? <laughs> Midwest is the best. No, I, <laughs> I, I mean, I think Chicago's contribution, I'm grateful to you for all the work you're doing with other people to raise up this contribution that Chicago and the Midwest has made toward the women's movement because it's really, really important. And there are women like the women in the labor movement, in the women's movement here everywhere. You know, there are women in New Jersey or mm -hmm. New York who have the same needs that, we, that were attempted to be addressed here. And some of them were, and some of them weren't. I mean, I also have friends in the East who did a lot of work on the employment issue, Noreen Connell in New York. And there was a woman in New Jersey who was the head of our task force on equal opportunity. So it's not that there weren't isolated people. It's just that the milieu of really hard work toward the economic issues was just reflected more in this part of the country, period. A practical shoulder to the wheel kind of hard work and compromise that was that would bring about actual changes I think was very an evidence here mm -hmm. so I'm proud of the work we did Great. proud of the work you're doing I'll take credit for your work <laughs> you can take credit for mine that's, that's a great yeah. way to end yeah okay all yeah. right thank you you're welcome <laughs>